to Eco Talks, the part of the show where we talk to people and personalities from the world of biodiversity conservation. And today we're going to be talking to a BBC producer and director and a marine biologist, Dr. Chad and Hunter. Thank you so much for joining us today. Hey there, Tony. Good to be here. <laughs> so you've described your childhood as being quite a dirt because you were born in Australia and you've been travelling all across the world and you moved to Arizona and then you previously moved back to Dar uh, Darwin, was it? Uh, well, Queensland, Queensland, Australia, in and out of Australia a few times. And, and so is this where your passion for adventure and, and travel and wildlife filmmaking actually began? I think so. I think, I think it's one of those things that I can't trace back to how early it was, but I, mm. I grew up in North Queensland, which is in the tropics, surrounded by rainforest and the Great Barrier Reef, and we had uh, green tree frogs crawling through the bedroom windows. And so I think there was always, in my childhood, that, that closeness to nature. And it probably helped that I had a very nomadic family following parents around for work. Um, so yeah, I think, I think that kind of that spirit of adventure and the outdoors was something that was all through my childhood. And after completing your bachelor's degree in marine biology, I believe, and you worked as a researcher as well, you met your very um, characterful uh, Professor Peter Doyer. Yeah. And I just wonder what it was like working with him and also being um, working within the forest. Professor Dwyer was one of those characters that I think really changes the course for students. I think a lot of us in our education meet a very inspiring teacher um, that can hook us on a certain path. And uh, this, this professor was one of those at UQ. Um, he just had this charisma in his lecture theatres. He, mm. he would come in barefoot, um, having come out of the Papua New Guinea bush with wild <laughs> hair and a crazy beard, but just loved his subject matter so much. And... I think a lot of us found him very inspiring and I you know, approached him to, to um, do a project. I think when he was first suggesting bowerbirds, I was a little bit, a little bit um, disappointed because they were, quite, they were small. I wanted to do animals with big brains. I wanted to do animals that were, that were intelligent and sexy. But when I got into bowerbirds and all their sexual selection and, and looking at their decision making and things, it, I found it absolutely fascinating. And I'd already loved the forest, so for me, you know, it was a joy kind of being out there um, in all that greenery. And so this actually, this interest in, in social behaviour and more kind of higher cognitive behaviour in, in higher animals led to you spending five years doing your PhD on Gelder baboons, I believe, in the Ethiopian uh, Mountain National Park? Yeah, it? yeah. So, so I knew that um, after I finished the, the bird research in Queensland mm. that I was looking for animals that... Um, uh, yeah, had bigger brains. I really wanted to do social animals because mm. <clears throat> uh, I knew that if I could find a social animal and have to watch them day in, day out, at least there'd be interactions and it would be entertaining. Uh, as much as I think a leopard is an incredibly beautiful mm. animal, if you're actually studying leopards day in, day out, you'd be following a lot of footprints, <laughs> picking up a lot of, a lot of bits of poo, analysing them. Whereas I knew that if I did something like monkeys... I could probably watch monkeys all day and be entertained because there's always something going on behaviorally. Uh, and so I was looking for a project which had sexual selection patterns which matched the stuff that I knew in Queensland. And the gelada baboons in Ethiopia happened to have a fascinating social system with female dominance and females picking and choosing males. So it fitted in, in the kind of the academic line that I was interested in. Yeah, because we actually see you in some of the clips and some of the interviews that you've had. Some of the males will actually come up to you and kind of use you as a, as a shoulder buddy to say, you know, don't mess with me because, you know, I've got a researcher buddy here. And yeah. stuff. So did you form quite close bonds with some of them, give them names? Yeah, well, I think, you, I think a lot of researchers end up naming their animals because you spend a long time out in the field mm. with no one else to talk to anyway. <laughs> Obviously, primates have a lot of character, mm. uh, and so they all get names for identification. As a researcher, you're trained never to really get involved with them. You don't mm. really, you're not supposed to interact with an animal because you're affecting the behavior that you're trying to research. Mm. So you're trying to be as neutral as possible. You're trying not to make eye contact because it's a threat. Oh, gosh, yeah. um, but generally, they will, they, will, they will use you as a bit of a tool if, in their social <laughs> interactions. So yes, they will come and sit beside you, try and pretend that you're on their side. You have to keep putting your head down, like, you know, <laughs> I'm not on anyone's side, I'm not on anyone's side. And, and, you know, you might have favourites because of their funny behaviour, but, you know, you don't get involved with, um, <laughs> with the behaviour. And peop local people were referring to, uh, to you as Monkey Man because you actually um, helped prevent a cult on them that was going to be imposed by the government because of 
they were sort of cropping and eating all the crops of the local people. And I wondered whether you, from that point on, when you actually changed and influenced a conservation and policy management decision, whether you kind of thought media can actually be a very useful tool in conservation? Yeah, I think that was a, that was the kind of the key moment for me was all the research I was doing wasn't really doing much to change local politics. And I knew that the locals had a big problem with the monkeys. I knew that the government wanted to kill the monkeys, a bit like the badger cull in the UK. And what I found was that going on television in Ethiopia and talking about these monkeys uh, reached many more people and it really created a change. So for me, that the power of media, just in that little stint on television, did much more for the gelada monkeys than three years of my research. And of course you've worked on the most incredible blue chip productions such as Frozen Planet, Planet Earth, Wild Rainbow as well, and you're currently working on a very exciting one now. But I wondered what's one of the most extreme conditions that you've had to film or, or the, are they kind of all unique in their own way? Um, I think Frozen Planet really tested us. I mean, that was, we were trying to get to the extremities of the earth. We were trying to get to places that, that people had never seen, um, would never see. So that put us in some situations which were quite dangerous. I think under ice diving is possibly the most extreme thing <laughs> we've done because you drill a little hole through this sheet of ice and you pop through. The water is minus two degrees. It's even colder than freezing because of the salt in it and you've got this one little lifeline but you've got no rope tethering you and so if anything goes wrong or you get caught in a current or something it's really really dangerous down there so we went through a lot of training um, we did you know ice diving courses and we have safety drills but that feeling of dropping through ice um, where the sting of that cold just bites um, you know and causes pain so quickly I think that to me felt like one of the edgiest things that we'd ever done. Um, we all came back, but you know, and <laughs> got the shots. <laughs> yeah, but um, but yeah, ice diving's ice diving's about the most perilous thing I've done. <laughs> and as an academic researcher, do you feel a strong need to emphasise the conservation messages, particularly in several of your productions? And do you think there'll be a future for this? Because of course, there's always a, a sort of drive to either do presenter-led or more cinematic and blue chip or kind of um, more Americanized styled productions. And I just wondered what you'd think, you know, for the future of, of conservation. Yeah, I, I, coming from wildlife biology and conservation biology, I wish we had more of it on television. Um, television is such a powerful medium. If we want to change people's perceptions, whether it's to do with litter or sustainability or climate change or logging, mm -hmm. there's no more powerful medium, I believe, than television. It's very hard to put conservation on television because a lot of TV broadcasters um, think that it'll turn people away. And we've always had this problem with natural history in that I think a lot of people come to wildlife for escapism. It might be Sunday night, you want to sit down with the family, you don't want to think about that day job you've got starting on Monday, you just want to be taken to where the polar bears live or taken to the mountains to see a snow leopard. And that I think is what, what a lot of people um, who aren't really into nature often will come to wildlife films just for escapism. If you start saying, well, this polar bears had it because the climate's changing and the sea levels are rising and it's because you drive that taxi tomorrow, a lot of people turn off. So we're always trying to find ways to, to get a message in. Mm. Um, some of the bigger series, like, like a, a Planet Earth or a Frozen Planet, we... we really don't say much about conservation for most of the episodes but what we'll do at the end once we've hooked the viewers and got them watching the series is then maybe do a final episode because by then they're like wow I've loved this series I've followed David Attenborough the whole way and then in the final episode you can talk about um, how climate change is affecting the poles or for a recent Africa series the final episode was about conservation issues but I think you have to accept that there's an entertainment need to be filled for natural mm -hmm. history. And finally, you're currently working on a major new series. I wondered if there's anything you could tell us, any little snippets that we could that we could have. Yeah, we've got a few exciting projects um, in the BBC Natural History Unit at the moment. Um, we're working on a, on a series at the moment which will be habitat based, um, very much in the style of planet Earth. That won't come out until 2016. There's a big series about predator and prey relationships called The Hunt which will come out later in 2015. 
And another exciting one that is just starting now, but will probably not come out till 2017, um, is called Oceans. And it's finally a big budget series about wow. uh, the marine world, which we haven't done since Blue Planet. Fantastic. So it's about timely that we kind of got back underwater. So there's a lot of big ones in the pipeline. Well, thank you so much for your time, Chad, and it's been such a fascinating experience having the opportunity to talk to you. But sadly, I'm afraid that's all we've got time for on Eco Talks today. But if you want to find out more about the world of conservation, please head over to our website on www.ecosafekin.org and please hit the subscribe button on YouTube. Bye!